I think what first sparked my interest in the field of ufology would have to do with the structures on Mars and NASA's explanation that these are all natural objects. Nothing anomalous to be seen here, but the data clearly shows something else that anyone with you know, two eyes can tell there's something there. Based on the evidence, as far as dealing with just the structures on Mars, I'd have to say it merits pretty good evidence for artificial structures. Uh, due to the fact that there's uh, geographic alignment to other things in the vicinity and that there's math being displayed that can only be done by somebody and not naturally, uh, weighs pretty heavy on my mind that obviously NASA knows something or maybe they're just being hesitant in telling us what they really know as far as imaging the surface of Mars. And in 1998, they re-imaged the surface of Mars. And what the problem was that this was supposed to be a high-resolution camera, 20 years newer technology. And the pictures did not seem to have that type of appearance. They were grainy, uh, you know, contrast low. And it only seemed to be for the region of Sidonia. And the fact that all the other pictures that they had taken with the Mars Global Surveyor, Surveyor camera uh, shows, you know, clear, concise data. When they get over Sidonia in the face, everything's blotchy and blacked out. Contrast resolution is down. So it makes me kind of wonder why that would be happening only in that one specific area for that mission. There's probably something there that NASA themselves are trying to figure out what's going on. And so telling the public, here's something interesting, but we don't have all the details, isn't something that they can do. And I would assume that probably these structures on Mars, if not are if not artificial, there could be other things going on there now, currently, that uh, you know NASA isn't publicly going to talk about. But the fascination with all the missions, polar lander, uh, the orbital insertion, all these new things, the, pli the climate, uh, the climate orbiter, all these things that they're now sending to Mars to study its atmosphere, astrobiology projects to see if life once existed there. Maybe they know something in a sense that they're trying to come up with data to show us a case history of where we are now because obviously there's something going on that they don't feel comfortable telling open, uh, you know, o openly about. So do you believe there is a, a cover-up at NASA? I don't believe there's a cover-up at NASA. I believe the way it would work would be that defense contracts and the things that get attached to the satellites and missions that go to Mars and other places are under defense contract. Or you know, when we send a satellite to Mars, it might have a mapping mission, but other things attached to it are under defense contract, so it's legally classified and so they can't discuss it so it just becomes non-existent. I would say it's very heavily uh, military in the sense that I'm not sure what organization would be on top of something like that but yes I would say it's more military based in the sense of trying to find out what's going on. There are many parallels between our modern Bible and the Sumerian tablets that are written in stone. These are artifacts that we still have that are thousands of years old yet scientifically we can confirm now what they were talking about when they say the distance between the planets, what the planets look like is if you were in space saying Uranus is a blue, watery, green planet. And the only way they could have that perspective knowledge is if they had actually seen the planet or someone who had told them. And so for a primitive culture to have that type of knowledge of the solar system, how the planets look in space, the distance between the planets, that's some pretty accurate information. And we can test that now because we've sent probes like the Voyager and Galileo out there. And when they imaged and took pictures, it precisely matched the Sumerian descriptions from thousands of years ago. So we have things all over the Earth, Stonehenge, Giza, Nazca, all these structures all over the Earth that display a type of technology or brilliance that you know, we don't attribute to primitive civilizations. So it really is kind of a, a, you know, a hands up in the air as to who built those. And then when we look at the Sumerian evidence of a superior race coming from another planet that visited us, as the Bible says, those who from heaven come to earth. So, you know, I, I only could wonder if maybe that actually did happen, that these structures, Stonehenge, Giza, Nazca, whatever, were all attributed to a certain gods, you know, that actually did exist at one time. We might call them aliens now, but then they were gods because we didn't have technology to understand. Uh, the Sphinx in Egypt uh, shows extensive watering on its surface as if it had just been inundated by rain. The last time it was raining on the Giza Plateau was 10,000 years ago. Yet there's clear geologic evidence on the Sphinx that it's been eroded by water extensively. So we would wonder, you know, how, how could that be if there hasn't been any water in Giza in 10,000 years? Yet 
the pyramids and the Sphinx were supposed to be built by the Egyptians 2,500 years ago. So it doesn't make sense. And there's all these little coincidences like that. For instance, another one. Uh, using star charts and mapping programs with computer software, we can show that the Orion constellation was an exact terrestrial map of the sky of the Giza Plateau. So in 10,000 BC, someone made the pyramids to form a terrestrial map of the sky of the Orion constellation. In that exact year, Leo, the constellation of Leo, is in the exact gaze of the Sphinx, where the Sphinx is looking at it, Leo, and the Orion constellation is right up above. So it's a terrestrial map in the sky at 10,000 years you know, before Christ. So it's kind of you know, anomalous as to how someone would be able to create that type of an alignment with structures that huge on Earth, let alone the fact that they're 10,000 years old. So The Anunnaki, as the Sumerians describe it, and the Sumerians, again, being the first culture on Earth coming right out of the Stone Age, describe a race of beings on a planet called Nibiru. They also said that Nibiru stood for planet of the crossing. They symbolized this with a cross 6,000 years ago. Now remember, this is 4,000 years before the time of Christ being crucified, yet they symbolized their planet as a cross, planet of the crossing. Word for word, as the Bible says, they created us in their image to look like the Anunnaki and after them, having their same behaviors and motions and stuff like that. It's currently a part of our solar system, but its orbit takes it so far beyond Pluto that Nibiru, like I said, has a 3,600-year uh, elliptical orbit. So when it goes beyond Pluto, it travels another billion miles out before coming back. So if it has a 3,600-year orbit and only passes the inner solar system every 3,600 years, we're only going to see it on a limited basis. There are various estimates. Some of them um, have to do with geological evidence. For instance, if another planet was to pass through the inner part of our solar system, the gravitational effect on our planet could cause plate tectonic activity, earthquakes, pole shifts. You know, one of the glaciers, for instance, maybe could have cracked off like an ice cube going into a glass of water, significantly raising the water level. So the last time it could have been around might have been the last great flood that we had or uh, the last great impact maybe in the Yucatan Peninsula. If this is another planet coming through, it's going to have other comets and asteroids following it. So when it passes, those remnant pieces could be subject to whacking us. And that's another interesting coincidence when we look at the fact that all the stuff being talked about in the media and NASA publicly of near-Earth asteroids and possible threats from outside our solar system. Once we found Uranus, we were able to detect that there's some type of a pull on it so that there should be another planet out there making that influence. Once we found Uranus, we found Neptune sitting out right behind it because of its influential uh, pull. So once they finally got to Pluto, found its moon, they still realized uh, an anomaly in the pull and thought there's still something out there that we're looking for. And that's how they, the, the search with even Percival Lowell uh, started for this other planet because they did mathematical calculations showing something's still pulling on the planet. But today with our modern science using the Hubble and various other imaging technologies, we're filming things like the Oort cloud well beyond the solar system, another asteroid belt out there, and all of these fragments and pieces are subject to believe to be part of planet X or another planet that once existed. Um, I'm not really sure if we'll ever meet these people or not, but I, I firmly believe that uh, there is uh, a Star Trek lifestyle for humans going on now, but the Earth civilization is just being quarantined because, you know, someone advanced looks at our planet from a distance and sees us killing ourselves and blowing up the planet. What are we going to do with more technology at this point except for to make it worse? So maybe they're just hoping to uh, push us along just enough to let us see the light, if you will, and make the changes ourselves.